In this video, we'll talk about transport in animals, and this is particular for the higher level content in B3.2 on transport. So when thinking about how our uh, circulatory system is organized, again, we have arteries carrying blood at high pressure away from the heart, and then veins returning blood back to the heart at low pressure. But it's actually these capillaries where things are going to diffuse between the blood and the tissues or between our tissues and the blood. And all of that works on this concept of pressure. So blood plasma um, is going to make its way to the capillary and it's going to be forced out, okay? So we call this the tissue fluid, and that fluid is um, full of things like oxygen and glucose and ions and stuff like that. Well, that is forced out due to the high pressure that is in this, um, you know, arterial section of our blood uh, network, okay? So once that fluid is forced out, it starts surrounding the cells and our tissues and things like oxygen and glucose are going to diffuse into the cells waste products like carbon dioxide are going to diffuse out of the cells and then that fluid will return back to the capillaries here okay and that blood um, or i should say that fluid will return back to those capillaries because this is in an area of low pressure so our veins are taking blood um, back to the heart under low pressure and so this tissue reuptake is very efficient due to the differences in pressure in our arteries and our veins. So let's take a look at the different transport mechanisms to get all these important things exchanged between the blood that's in our capillaries, so this is a capillary, and the nearby cells that make up our tissues. Okay, now oxygen, which I have here in these little blue circles, is going to diffuse from the blood into our tissues using passive diffusion, okay? So this is just simple diffusion. That's the movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration without the input of energy. So as long as we have a high concentration of oxygen in our blood, then that oxygen will passively diffuse into this um, area where our tissues are um, just using simple diffusion. We also need glucose to move into our tissues, like out of our blood into our tissues. Now, sometimes that's going to be against the concentration gradient, like we're moving it from a low concentration um, to a relatively high concentration, but it's still going to be passive because most often what we're going to find is that it's the sodium glucose co-transporters that are helping to move that. So you may recall that is um, an indirect form of of passive transport. So energy is used to actively pump um, sodium ions and create an area of high concentration. And then glucose and sodium move together into an area where there's a low concentration of sodium. That's in another topic. You can go back and review that on your own, but that's going to be the main mechanism of movement. The important part here to understand is that glucose needs to move into the cells. So from the blood, into the cells, just like oxygen. And that should make sense. Glucose and oxygen should be moving together because we need them both for cell respiration. So as long as you can remember that, you're in a good spot. So if oxygen and glucose are moving into the cells and they are the substrates necessary for cell respiration, then the product of cell respiration, carbon dioxide, needs to be moving out of the cells and that's going to be carried by the blood to the heart while it'll be pumped to the lungs and exhaled. Well, that is going to move via passive diffusion, so from the cells into our blood, and that moves on concentration gradients, so from high to low. So as long as the concentration of carbon dioxide is relatively low in our blood, 
that will help the movement of carbon dioxide out of our tissues and into our blood. So what we're gonna notice here are two important themes. One is that we need to understand which materials are moving into our cells and which are moving out. And we need to understand the importance of concentration gradients in maintaining that movement. Now, out of all of the fluid that's forced out of the capillaries and into the surrounding tissues, about 85% of that then returns to the capillary network and then through the veins, et cetera, but not all of it. About 15% of that fluid is going to drain not into our cardiovascular system, but our lymphatic system. And that fluid is then called lymph. So eventually that will drain back into our heart and blood and circulatory system. But I just want to let you know, we do have an alternative transport mechanism. It isn't just the cardiovascular um, arteries, veins, capillaries. It's also the lymphatic system that can carry some of that excess fluid as well. So let's do a very rough overview of how um, the circulatory systems in mammals work. I know the human heart has four chambers and we'll get to that later, but for now I'm just gonna draw two sides of the heart, this side and this side, because they, they kind of have different jobs, right? So what we're gonna find is that blood is going to leave this side of the heart and it's going to travel to the rest of the body. And that has to be under very high pressure. So if we think about my little heart has to be able to pump blood all the way down to my toes, we're gonna need a lot of pressure in that part of our circulatory loop, okay? So of course, then blood is going to return to the heart Okay, back to the body this way, but it's going to be deoxygenated. So that blood then needs to be sent to the lungs, okay, where it's going to pick up oxygen and it's going to return to the heart again so that it can be pumped to the rest of the body and we can kind of complete that loop. So we started here, it's pumped to the body, it returns to the heart, it's pumped to the lungs and it returns to the heart and then we have this whole thing going. So what we can kind of see here are two separate loops, all right? So if I kind of do, if I kind of like split them in half, right? I have a loop that involves the heart and the lungs, and then I have a loop that involves the heart and the rest of the body. And so this is what we call the double pump, okay? Or the double circulation in mammals. And this is all necessary because of pressure. I need, again, a lot of pressure, okay, to get that blood from the heart to the rest of the body. But if I had that higher pressure, if this blood right here was under very high pressure going to the lungs, we wouldn't be able to get the diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the capillaries. If the pressure in the capillaries was too high, then I would never be able to get oxygen to move from the capillary or from the alveoli into the capillary. It just would not happen. We need the pressure in the alveoli to be higher than the pressure inside the capillary in order to help get this gas to diffuse um, efficiently. So we need this loop here, the loop that involves the lungs, to be under a much lower pressure, right? So that is the reason why in mammals we need separate circulatory systems, right? We need separate loops. We need a low pressure loop that involves the lungs and a high pressure loop that involves the rest of the body. Now fish don't need this double circulatory loop. They can send blood from their heart to their gills at the same high pressure that is required from getting the blood from the gills to the rest of the organs because instead of air being outside of the gills, what's out here is water. And that water is um, creating enough pressure to where that blood that's coming through the gills um, isn't going to overwhelm or pop those gills or pop any blood vessels. Okay, we're getting this balanced uh, area of pressure. And so fish don't need that double loop in their circulatory system, that the high pressure that they need to get blood from their gills to their organs 
is an okay amount of pressure when it's coming to the gills. Now on my paper, I normally do this in pencil and then I'll go back over it with pen. And the reason is because um, I'm gonna start off with four chambers to my heart, but I'm gonna end up drawing in some holes or using my eraser to draw some holes. And actually it's not an even four chambers, it's a little bit uh, bigger here on the bottom. So blood is actually going to enter this top chamber of the heart, okay? And again, one of the things that I need to be able to understand is what I'm looking at here, that on my, on my paper, this looks like the left side, but this is actually the right side. I gotta think of it as like a patient is lying down on my operating table. So blood is going to enter the right side of the heart and it's entering through a structure called the vena cava. All right, so that's this blood vessel right here. And blood is then going to flow into this um, chamber of the heart. So this is my right atrium. Okay, so the right atrium is this chamber right here. And then from there, it's going to flow into this bottom chamber. And this bottom chamber is called the right ventricle. So the ventricles um, of the heart are here on the bottom. In order to get there, it's got to pass through a series of valves, okay? And so these valves open this way. They can also shut, they can swing this way to where they're shut, but right now I have them shown in their open position. And these are something called the atrioventricular valves, okay? So here I have this section of the heart. Okay, now blood is going to then be leaving the right ventricle, and I'm, I see that here, okay? So here's my right atrium, here is the AV valve, here is the right ventricle, and it's going to go through this blood vessel right here, and it's going to be going to the lungs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make a space to where I can kind of draw a blood vessel that's leaving, and so it's leaving from the ventricle, and it's going to go to the lungs, okay? And it's got these little valves in here that point this way. So they open this way, okay? They can also shut, okay? But they open that way. And these are called the semilunar valves. Now, some people may refer to them as the pulmonary valves, and that's named after this blood vessel that they are um, connected to, and this is the pulmonary artery. Okay, so artery because it's going away from the heart, pulmonary means it's going to the lungs. Okay, so blood is going to flow from the vena cava into the right atrium through these AV valves. When the ventricle squeezes, it's going to force the blood into the pulmonary artery and it is going to go to the lungs. Now, blood is going to then become oxygenized. It's going to return from the lungs through this blood vessel here. And this is the pulmonary vein. It's going to flow into the left atrium and it's going to flow through a set of AV or atrioventricular valves. So just like what we talked about on this side and then into the left ventricle. The left ventricle, when it squeezes, is going to force blood through this big blood vessel here to the rest of the body. So I need a way to draw that in. So I'm just gonna make a little hole here. This is why I used pencil. And this hole is for this giant blood vessel called the aorta. Okay, aorta, and it has its own pair of semilunar valves here and here. Some people call those the aortic valves, okay, um, aortic valves, because they um, separate the ventricle from the aorta. So you can either call them semilunar valves or aortic valves. And this is a very rudimentary picture of the blood vessels and valves in the heart, but we're not quite done yet. So what you'll have noticed by now, I'm sure, is that the muscular walls of the atria are much thinner than the muscular walls of the ventricles. 
I need to make sure that my drawings are proportional. So I'm going to make sure that the muscular walls of my ventricles are much thicker than the muscular walls of my aorta. And I'm also going to make sure that the muscular wall of my left ventricle is much thicker than the right. So there's a good reason for that. This left ventricle has to be able to pump blood at an extraordinarily high pressure all the way to the rest of the body. This right ventricle only has to create enough pressure to get to the lungs. So they're going to be much different in their thickness. I'm also going to label um, a couple of other things here. So I have this thing called the septum, and the septum is this separation right here in the middle of my heart. So this is going to separate the, the right side of my heart from the left side. And then let's see, I'm also going to find some specialized tissue and that will help to initiate the heartbeat. And for this, I'm actually gonna draw this in a different color just because my drawing is getting a little bit confusing. So right here in the right atrium, I have something called the SA node, okay? The SA node stands for sinoatrial node. Okay, and that's going to help initiate the heartbeat. Also in the right atrium, I'm going to have another node, and this one is called the AV node. Okay, so those are right here, um, and we'll talk more about their features in just a minute. All right, so we've got the form part down. Now what about all of the functions? So if I think about which structure prevents mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, well, deoxygenated blood is typically over here on the right side of the heart, and oxygenated blood comes from the lungs and is pumped out by the left side of the heart. So that structure that separates the two of them, that is, of course, the septum. Okay. Bringing oxygenated blood to the heart tissue itself. Okay, well, branching off of the aorta, and we didn't draw this in our drawings, that would be crazy. Um, these are the coronary arteries. Okay, so the coronary arteries branch off of the aorta, and they carry that oxygen-rich blood to the heart tissue itself. The heart's a muscle. It needs stuff. Okay, the initiation of the heartbeat um, is the SA node, and some people call this the pacemaker, okay? Um, it's another name for that node. Collecting blood and contracting to squeeze blood into the ventricles, those are the atria. So the two atria are gonna both contract at the same time, and both of them squeeze blood into the ventricles. The um, parts of the heart, the chambers that contract to pump blood into the arteries, those are the ventricles, and those ventricles also contract simultaneously. So when these both contract, the right ventricle will send blood to the lungs and the left ventricle to the rest of the body. Preventing the black flow of blood into the atria when the ventricle contracts, okay? So I can imagine when this ventricle contracts, we want the blood flowing through the arteries. We don't want it going back into the atria, and that is exactly what these AV valves are for, okay? And then preventing blood from flowing back into the ventricle when the ventricle is relaxed, okay? Well, all this happens on opposite um, timing. Um, when the ventricle is contracting, it's pushing blood through the arteries. When the ventricle is relaxing, that's because the atria is contracting and pushing blood in there. So when this ventricle is relaxed, we're gonna have the tendency for blood to wanna flow back into the ventricle, and we need this set of valves to prevent that. And that's the job of those semilunar valves. Those semilunar valves, um, you again could call them either the pulmonary valve or the aortic valves, um, can close to prevent that backflow. The one node that we labeled but we didn't talk about is the AV node. The AV node has a function in getting that heartbeat signal to these ventricles. 
Now, if you've already taken a look at the topic on muscles, um, then this will be a quick review, but the cardiac muscle itself, if I zoom in and I look at how the cells are put together, we're gonna notice that cardiac muscle tissue is much different than like skeletal muscle tissue. So it's got a couple of features that I think are worth your time to go back and review if you've already studied this, um, one of which is called an intercalated disc. Okay, and these intercalated discs are going to help um, form connections and passages of electrical signals since we have a lot of contractions happening there. We also need those contractions to be coordinated throughout the heart tissue. And so that's where this cell branching is really helpful. Okay, so we can have more coordinated contractions. And we also say that these cardiac contractions are what we call myogenic. And that means um, that they can contract without the input of nerve uh, impulses. So myo meaning muscle, geno meaning to start. They literally start on their own. So a complete set of steps um, is what we call a cardiac cycle. And this cardiac cycle happens about 70 times per minute, although that can vary with a lot of things. And it involves two basic concepts, systole, which is contraction, and diastole, which is relaxation. So here's how I remember that. Systole sounds like squeezing, and diastole sounds like dilate, right, to come open and relax. So that's a good way to remember those. So in the first part here, um, what we're going to show is the atria contracting. And it's important to remember that both atria are going to contract at the same time, that the left and the right side of the heart are coordinated. So here's what we're seeing. I'll try to draw them in over here. So these atria contract, and that's going to be right in this step over here. Okay, so when both of these atria contract, that is going to force these AV valves to open. And when they open, that blood is going to start to flow into the ventricles. Okay, so the atria contract, the AV valves open, blood flows into the ventricles because if the ventricles are relaxed and the atria are contracted, Okay, that blood is going to want to flow towards the lower pressure. So in this section, the atria are in systole and the ventricles are in diastole. There's about a one second gap, and that's due to this SA node and AV node firing at different times. So the SA node fires and it makes the atria contract. Then there's a small gap and that AV node will fire and then we're into this second step here. So now in this part of the diagram, we can see the ventricles contracting. When the ventricles contract, what that's gonna do is it's gonna slam these AV valves shut. So they were open when blood was flowing into the ventricles. When the ventricles are squeezing, it's going to force those AV valves to shut, and that prevents blood from flowing back into those atria. That's very important. It also forces these semilunar valves here to open, and that means that blood is able to go from these ventricles into the arteries. Okay, and then we start this cycle all over again. So after the ventricles have been in systole, okay, then we're going to switch, okay? Then they're going to go in diastole, okay? These atria have meanwhile filled with blood and we start this cardiac cycle all over. So in this diagram, we're going to look at the length of one cardiac cycle. So it's a little bit less than a single second and we're gonna be tracking the pressure. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can measure pressure. Usually when we're talking about our cardiovascular system, we're talking about MMHG or millimeters of mercury. So um, an interesting unit for pressure there. And we're gonna look at the pressure in three different places, an atrium, a ventricle, and an artery. So when we're first starting the atrium, it's gonna be at relatively low pressure, and then when it undergoes systole, that pressure is going to increase. It doesn't increase for very long, it's a relatively short time, and during that time, the pressure of the ventricle is going to be going down. 
So what we can notice here is that in general, the ventricle is just under higher pressure anyways. Think about this. The atrium only has to push the blood into the ventricle. The ventricle has got to be able to push blood either to the all the way to the lungs or to the rest of the body. The important part here is that we can understand that as the atrium is increasing in pressure, it's under systole. And then while that's happening, the ventricle needs to be in diastole um, so that it can fill up with blood. Now, that atrium is then going to relax, okay? And what's going to happen when the atrium is relaxing? That ventricle is going to contract, okay? And that ventricular contraction is going to take um, a little bit of a longer time, all right? So that ventricular contraction will last a little while, and that atrial contraction, again, the atria needs to be relaxed while the ventricle is contracting. So the way that we can kind of connect these two things, when something is contracting, the pressure is going to go up. Think about it, it's squeezing the blood. When something is relaxed, that pressure is going to go down, okay? So when the atria contract, the ventricles have to relax, and when the ventricles contract, the atria have to contract, and then we would see this happening over again, okay? So I would get this cardiac cycle happening multiple times. What's very interesting here is that these arteries are always going to be at relatively high pressure, that they're going to be at a higher pressure even at the ventricles. Now, their pressure is going to increase when the ventricles contract, but it's never going to go all the way back down. Why is that? Well, because we can't just have blood stop flowing through our body. It's important to maintain the flow of blood in our arteries. So remember, our arteries have muscular walls, so even when the ventricles are relaxed, the arteries can contract and keep that blood moving through there. So arteries are always at high pressure. They uh, the pressure can increase when those ventricles contract, and that we feel as our pulse, right? Um, but they're always going to be at a much higher pressure. You do not need to know how to draw this diagram, but you do need to know how to interpret it. And again, the main takeaways here are ventricles are always under higher pressure than atria, that when one chamber is contracting, the other one must relax, and that arteries are always under high pressure to maintain the blood flow.